Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel H&E Life. So today I wanted to talk about some myths about pathology and busting some of these myths for you. Actually, I'll be busting all of these myths for you today because there is a lot of myths, I guess, representation about pathology by the media or by people who don't understand really what pathology is. So let's get into it. All right, number one myth I want to bust is pathologists don't have any patient interaction. Overall, it is somewhat true. Depending on what you want to do in pathology, you may opt for a subspecialty of pathology that has absolutely no patient interaction, and that might be actually what you want. And uh, that is what I want. So I am now si going to be signing out GI pathology only. So I will be just looking at, at wet tissue and slides. Whereas if you were a person who is interested in pathology, but also want to keep their patient interactions, there's uh, a quite a few choices for you. For example, you can do cytopathology. As a cytopathologist, you will get to do FNAs, which are fine needle aspirations, and you will get to go to clinic, whatever clinic, generally it's a cancer clinic. So for example, a woman who has a history of breast cancer goes to breast cancer clinic and she has a palpable lymph node, or she has a lymph node in her neck, or she has some nodule that's like sitting on the surface of her skin. Instead of having a painful biopsy where, you know, they have to cut out the tissue. As a cytopathologist, you can come into clinic and you can set up to do a fine needle aspiration yourself in which you will stick a very th thin needle into whatever palpable nodule there is and you'll take a little bit of cell sample from that and from there you'll be able to make uh, that quick prelim diagnosis slash permanent diagnosis in a few days and let the patient and the clinician know what is in that nodule. While you're doing the FNA, that person is your patient. There is one good example for patient interaction. Another good one is in the CP world for blood bank, you are actually depending on what kind of blood bank service you end up working for. So anywhere that has an apheresis center, then you will be having daily patient interaction because as the patient is getting their apheresis procedure performed, you will will come before that procedure, you'll do a quick HMP, then you'll come every now and then to check on the patient. And when it's all done, you'll write a note about what happened. If the patient has a reaction to any of the products that were given, then you are the person who's there to prescribe whatever treatment they need to make sure their reaction is managed. And until that patient goes either back to the inpatient setting or if they go home, uh, you're that person's doctor while they're getting that procedure done. Another place in blood bank where you have patient interaction is when you are in the blood donation center. Um, sure, most of the time, all of these blood donation center is managed by nurses who do the blood draw, but if a patient has any sort of adverse reaction, if they faint or they become nauseous or anything, then you are the person that is this patient's current temporary doctor and you'll need to assess them to make sure if they're safe to leave the blood donation center, if you need to send them to the ED or you can wait a little bit and then go home safely. So that's another place where you have patient interaction. The second myth I want to bust is pathologists are all introverts and uh, we're all geeky nerds who, you know, sit in the dark room and look at a microscope because if you ever see a medical show and they show their pathologist, that's literally what they do. Like in Scrubs, the pathologist is the person who is sitting in a dark room and super mean and blah, blah, blah. But generally, most pathologists are really nice people and true, uh, there's a decent number of introverts, but you know, there's a bunch of people who are very outgoing too. And I've met a bunch of people who have like literally one of my co-residents and soon to be a blood bank attending, he just loves talking to people. He wants to get to know everyone. He wants to be there for everyone. So there are a whole range of people who work in pathology from, yes, there's the probably on the spectrum, very introverted pathologist, but at the same time, there's people who are more outgoing and generally friendly. I, you know, think of myself as generally friendly, but I am also an introvert because I can't keep this up. I could do this for you guys for a short amount of time, but then after that, I kind of need to cool down, sit alone, play my video games, and not talk to anyone for a while. But I digress. All right, back to the topic of myths and pathology. Myth number three, pathology results are instantaneous, or, you know, turnaround time is a couple of hours. 
wrong. Like sure, there are tests in pathology that are quick turnaround times. Like if you order a CBC, sure, that will turn around in a couple hours because they're very automated testing. But if you want to do a biopsy and know your results in the next couple of hours, that's physically impossible because uh, specimens that especially go through search path, they need to come in, they need to be uh, grossed by someone, they need to be fixed long enough. And then you'll also uh, have someone embed the specimen in paraffin so in wax and once the blocks are made then you also then need someone to cut each of these blocks into tissue slices at five micron thickness each and put it on a glass slide and then the glass slide needs to be stained and then it needs to be sorted and given to a pathologist so you know that at the very least is 24 hours if it's like super fastly done and the pathologist needs some time to get to the case and look at it and then write their report right so realistically if you get a pathology report out in two days that's like already pretty good that said the more complicated your case is the longer the turnaround time so for example if a surgeon removes this ginormous cancer resection with multiple organs attached not only does all of that need to fix in formalin so we could cut open without destroying the margins then we have to sample every organ sample the cancer make sure all the margins are represented and all of that needs to fix again to make sure the tissue is properly fixed before it goes into processing and be made into blocks and cut and stained and all of that and if you get the results back in like three to four days for something that complicated that's also a really good turnaround time i admit there are times in surgical pathology that the turnaround time is like over a week that's probably because it's something complicated and we're working it up with additional stains we're showing this around to other people because i don't want to give you a wrong diagnosis so if i don't know what it is i'm going to show it to someone else and they might be like ah okay i see you run these tests and i look at this i think you should add these other tests on it and then you know then we'll come up with a diagnosis and while all of the, that testing and thinking and consulting that ends up taking four or five six seven eight nine if we order a really complicated like a molecular testing that might take a month to come out in pathology you could get fast turnaround times with something as simple as a routine test that's completely automated you give me a sample i stick in the machine the machine gives you the answer and that answer gets uploaded onto epic if you give me a piece of tissue that's gonna need a lot more hands-on and physical labor myth number four is that a pathologist is not a real doctor because we don't treat patients well i already sort of busted this myth when number one saying yes depending on what kind of pathologist you are you will see and treat patients but uh in terms of we're not a real doctor that's completely 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 false because to become a pathologist you need to go to medical school and you have an md and by default md equals doctor yay um but on top of that we also have at least three to four to five to six years of additional training to specialize in what we do so we're very knowledgeable and in the sense we're not a traditional doctor like i mentioned in my previous video more like a doctor's doctor a clinician will have a patient come to them with something like a tumor or they'll come with like oh hey i'm not feeling too well and they'll do a workup and imagery shows there's some lesions in the body so that needs to get biopsy and um well honestly you know just by doing a physical just by looking at some imaging you can't tell exactly what that thing is you could hypothesize be like based on these findings and these lab values i think that this could possibly be blah blah and blah but then you won't know for sure until you send it for a tissue diagnosis that's where pathologies come and play we are the doctor's doctor because we tell the doctors what we have and then they can do their job by knowing what it is and how to then treat the patient accordingly so without us they are basically like treating the patient on the best educated guests whereas most of the time we look at something it's like okay this is what it is but of course like anything in medicine there's always the gray zone and where like we look at something it's like well i think it's this um i'm not 100 percent sure but this is also my best guess but at that point our best guess is the best guess because we have not only what the clinician thinks is their best guess we have what the radiologist thinks is their best guess and with all that together we put our best guess together so it's the best guess of the best guesses i guess <laughs> all right but yes we are doctors, we are real people with real MDs or DOs, and we don't treat patients directly, we treat them indirectly through our clinicians.
Okay, another myth is we do all the te lab tests and uh, we make the slides or something like that, where this is probably very much influenced by, once again, medical TV shows in which, you know, like in scrubs, if they need to run some tests, they'll literally take the patient's sample, hand it off to a pathologist, and then however many later, the pathologist will hand them a folder with the diagnosis in it. It doesn't work like that. Basically, as pathologists, our main job, at least in surgical pathology, is to look at tissue and look at the slides that come and we make a diagnosis, we type it into a computer and it goes into Epic. But we have a lot of support tech. We have histotechs who make the tissue blocks, they cut, and they they stain and they cover slip and all of that. We also have technicians in our clinical labs who do most of the routine testing. So they will take the samples, pipette into little things, load into the machine. Or we have physician assistants who, um, you know, do a good chunk of the grossing. A specimen comes from the OR and needs to be processed and cut. Uh, that's what the uh, pathology assistants are most most of their job is they get the specimens they cut it they sample it they submit it for uh, processing to be made into slides so we have a lot of support and as pathologists if you're a surgical pathologist your main job is to look at slides and make diagnosis uh, if you're a clinical pathologist I mentioned your main job is personnel management to make sure tests are running up to grade and if something bad happens or some weird test result happens you're there to troubleshoot and work it out Okay, the next and last biggest myth I want to address is that AI will eventually replace pathologists because AI is up and coming and AI can make diagnosis of cancer. Why would we need to pay people to do this? We have computers who will eventually learn how to do this themselves. And yes, I agree. AI is coming and it's going to come to pathology, but I am excited for it. No. I do not believe, at least in my lifetime, that any computer is gonna replace me or a hospital's need for me to do my job. Because the way I see AI is there are, AI are very good at quantifying things. They're very good at identifying and counting things or pattern recognition. So I think of AI as one, they will be able to interpret stupid IHCs that I don't wanna interpret anymore. For example, they will be so good at counting mast cells on an IHC, or they will be so good at counting number of mitosis on a tissue for staging prop, uh, purposes or they'll be so good at looking the K, at the KI-67 and giving me a, a proliferation index uh, because, you know, I look at a tissue, I'm not going to count every cell and then count how many cells are positive and how many cells are negative. I'm going to make a the best guesstimate on what the percentage is, whereas an AI can actually count all the cells in that tissue and count all the positive cells and give me an actual percentage. Um, or an AI can interpret prognostic IHC, such as, for example, pdl one This is like a new hit thing. Everyone's giving some sort of pdl one inhibitor, but to be able to get the drug, you need to have the IHC done and someone need to give you a score. And if the score is high enough, then they qualify for pdl one Whereas, counting the scoring for pdl one is so tedious. You literally have to count number of positive cells over on positive cells, or you have to count total positive tumor cells plus positive inflammatory cells over total tumor volume. Oh my gosh, it's a, it's a hassle, but I cannot wait for an AI to do this for me. And basically I order it, the AI will look at the IHC and quantify and report that. And I don't even have to look at it. And that's yay. Okay. Other thing I see AI helping us is the volume of biopsies is just going up because people are living longer, they're getting more cancers, and we are betting imaging which are catching more cancers and we're also screening for things more now like colon cancer used to be screening starting when you're 15, now it's starting to screen it when you're 40. So now we have a whole load of people who are getting colon cancer screening as well as a bunch of people who are getting to that age that needs colon cancer screening. So like for example, GI biopsy volume just keeps going up, up and up. And while we're not pumping out any more GI pathologists faster than we used to. So if we had an AI who can screen GI biopsies, be like, this is benign, this is malignant. And then all the benign cases just get like signed out uh, by the computer. Great. Like, you know, for example, what I mean by this, uh, there is no, diagnosis here. Nothing, everything looks normal. Computer signs it out. 
great. Anything's like, oh, there's something abnormal on this tissue slide. All of that goes to pathologists. And I feel like 30% of our workload will instantly decrease because we no longer have to look through all of the normal slides. We could just look at the, the not normal slides and make our benign or malignant diagnosis. So I think that's another way to streamline our work and make our lives easier. And like I said, these are the reasons why I cannot wait for AI in pathology to actually like, yay. Um, and another thing uh, sort of related to AI is like digital pathology. They're like, oh, now we have digital pathology. We don't need to train our own pathologists. We can send all of our uh, specimens to digitally pathology by like, I don't know, some cheap, cheaper, I don't know, they could send it to India and it will cost less than paying a United States pathologist to read the slides. True, you could do that. But at the same time, digital pathology requires a lot of IT setup and not a lot of places in the US even have a digital pathology available in this in this such a well established setting in which you can actually make diagnoses of actual patient slides on a digital slide um, in comparison to the glass slide almost all 99% of pathologists in the US probably still sign out by glass. Only very few select institutions still allow people to have the technology to sign digitally. So that is not going to be like a bam, next minute I know everything's going to India or going to China or something like that. That is going to be work in the progress. But at the same time, I know for a fact that my job is not going to be sent out to another country to a person who can't speak English because one, our clinicians are English and they're English speaking and they will like their, their reports in English and they will like it in proper English. And they will also... A new big thing is tumor boards. They want to speak to their pathologists. They want their pathologists to be present every week to show them their, their tissue diagnoses and talk about what their diagnosis mean and what does it mean for patient care. And the, together we discuss what's the next best move for patient treatment. Would they rather work with a pathologist who you know can't do the work but then can't have good communication skills or they rather have someone real time that they could call uh, because you know we are working the same hours as they are, they could just call me and be like, hey, can you go over this report with me? And I could explain to them or be like, okay, this patient is going to be on tumor board tomorrow. Can you talk about it? And so I feel like nowadays there's more and more interdisciplinary conferences. And because of this, in-person pathology is still very much needed. And I am not scared about digital pathology either. So I think that wraps up for today. I think I bust some myths about pathology. That's common misconceptions about pathology as well. And if anyone has any other myths they have heard about pathology or any other like thing they heard about pathology and want to ask if this is true, please leave it down in the comments and I will bust those myths for you or I will confirm those true statements for you <laughs> uh, depending on what you write. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. So please like and hit the notification button to keep supporting me and my channel and uh, I will see everyone next time. Bye!